I'm here in California, just here for some work. Um, unfortunately, uh, I just missed the launch of the XT4. I actually did see the camera before I left, but I didn't get a chance to take it with me. They wouldn't let, it, let me bring it to uh, California. I've just taken a bit of a drive up here into the mountains, Big Bear Mountain. And uh, it's awesome, you know, for South Africa to go skiing. What a pleasure. But yeah, I hope you guys are well. Thanks for the support on the channel. I really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, um, I will be posting a video soon on the XT4 review. Uh, I'll get my hands on it as soon as I get back to South Africa. I'll put it through its paces and I'll let you know what I think. Cheers, take care. I personally prefer full frame. And my preference is Fuji GFX series and Fuji X series cameras. Before we get stuck in, thanks so much for those of you who have subscribed and the support. I really do appreciate it. I hit 5,000 subscribers end of last year and it was a big thing for me. I mean, 5,000 is not a lot in, in relation to YouTube in general. But for me, it meant that there's 5,000 people out there interested in my take on a lot of things, you know, some of the tutorials I do, some of the reviews that I do, and I really do appreciate it. For those of you who are first time viewers, welcome. Thanks for, you know, your time is valuable, I know that. So thanks for watching my video. If you like what you see here, please go and see some other videos, whether it be reviews or tutorials, you're more than welcome. And if you like what you see there, please do subscribe. It's much appreciated. I was planning in November last year to do a road trip out of Cape Town. I'm Cape Town based, I'm in South Africa, and I was gonna do a trip around parts of the Western Cape, which is very, very beautiful. And I was gonna bring you along. But unfortunately, my little four by four broke down on me. The transfer case went in November, and it's a 26 year old car. So I had to order some parts in, uh, they finally came in, and then I managed to repair it myself, rebuild the transfer case, which was fun, I gotta admit. I love working on my car, but I, do apologize that I didn't make it out onto the road trip. It would have been great. So that is on my plans to do a road trip. I do have a busy season now, but I'm gonna try to fit it in somewhere. But when I do, you'll be the first to know. As mentioned before, there's a lot of people covering this topic on full frame and crop. It's a saturated topic, totally. Um, I'd say my point of view is a very small percentage of point of views. I have seen one or two videos where they kind of talk down the lines of what I'm gonna talk about, which was quite interesting. Um, but certainly this is not a mainstream view. And please don't get me wrong. If you were to approach me and say, oh, I see you using a crop camera or, oh, is that a full frame camera? And you use it in terms of sensor size, I totally get where you're coming from. I understand what you're saying. So first off, there are certain things that cannot change on a camera. That when we refer to differences between systems, we're talking about equivalences. All right, we're not talking about actual change, physical changes to cameras. So a focal length, for example, is a physical property of a lens. It may not be exactly what that focal length is written. So it, say it's a 35 millimeter lens. In the manufacturing of the lens, they might be a 34, it might be a 36, but they round it off to 35, but it's actual physical property of the lens. So when we talk about different sensor sizes, or even different formats, and the sensor sizes within those formats, we're talking about equivalences. That's all it is, it's just equivalence. You wanna know what the equivalent would be in another system. When people say things like, oh, the manufacturer's lying to you because it actually isn't a 2.8 lens, it's, it's, it's an F4 lens. I don't think those are helpful conversations to have. And it has actually very little to do with actually going out and shooting and making photographs. I know many people with very, what we'd call inferior products, old products who haven't changed their product, their, their cameras and lenses in years and years and years and, and by today's standards would be viewed at as a pathetic product who go out there and produce amazing photographs. They're very comfortable with shooting with it. They understand the system, they understand the format size and that's all that's important to them. So remember, be realistic about these conversations. I understand there's a difference and it is helpful to know equivalences, especially if you're moving from one system to another. But in the greater scheme of things, you got to create an image with what you have in your hand. You got to do your best you can and understanding the camera you have is most important. I used to shoot on film. I was a professional photographer on film and transitioned into professional photography on digital. I shot weddings on film, so I know film cameras very well. But my history with film goes even further. As most people in their 40s and older than me, you'll know, even late 30s, you would know that in people's homes, the cameras we used weren't cell phones, they weren't digital cameras, they were film cameras, whether they were cheap little rangefinder plastic cameras, whether we had those bulb packs where you burnt the bulb and there were 10, 10 bulbs and once you do it, you had to replace the bulbs, or whether you had some really nice film cameras in your home, SLRs or you know, little medium formats or whatever it is. Um, 
film is normal. Film was just everyday stuff. It's the same way young people see digital today. That's what we use was film. I mean, obviously, it's taken on quite a trendy sort of aspect today. You know, you shoot on film, wow, you know, and it's sort of artistic, and I understand that. But I understand that film was, back then for me, was just normal. That was life. That's what you shot on. That was photography. So 35 millimeter film, um, at least by the time I was shooting, was the standard, the go-to film. Um, I think it, it, it reached a sort of cost versus quality balance. It, it um, certainly took into account most photographers' needs and covered, I think, most photographers, whether you were someone just using it for family use or uh, someone who's taking it up as a hobby or for professionally. 35 millimeter film covered most photographers. Large format cam cameras and medium format cameras obviously offered you higher quality, but the cameras are massive. They weren't fast, they were slow. It was a process. Um, and smaller, there were even smaller um, film sizes as well, which obviously lacked in quality, especially if you're looking to print larger. So 35 really struck that sort of sweet spot. Film photography was a massive industry and manufacturers have put a lot of time and effort into creating systems around 35 millimeter film. They created huge lens lineups. You know, most of the lens lineups we in the big manufacturers we have today are still lenses that are actually were designed around film. But importantly, they designed the mount and they designed the lens around that film size. Okay, so the 35 millimeter refers to the measurement from top of sprocket to bottom of sprocket. Remember, film on a film camera runs sideways, so you're getting sort of landscape exposures. Motion picture film was different. It ran that way as opposed to that way. I mean, there were different film sizes in motion picture as well. But nevertheless, in photography, that became the standard. I was a bit late to the digital game. Not too late, but could have transitioned a bit earlier. The first cameras I remember, even though there, were, there was already a digital SLR, um, I think manufactured in the 80s, I think it was Nikon. Could be wrong. Don't quote me on, the, quote me on that. But I certainly... Um, the ones that come to mind was the D30 and the D60 that Canon had brought in. It was a 3 megapixel and a 6 megapixel camera, the D31 and the D60. They didn't quite meet what I believed was the quality that film was giving me. So I was quite negative about that. And I thought, ah, oh, this is never going to you know, do well, never going to take off. And then a friend of mine, um, I was living in Ireland at the time, and he bought the 10D. That was when the numbers moved before the D as opposed to after the D. It was the first run. Um, of camera and it was a six megapixel or 6.3 I forget somewhere around there and it was a fantastic camera and I started to go mm, okay maybe there's benefits to this I slowly started to change my mind I never bought that camera but I did buy the next one that came out in that series it was called the 20D it was an 8.2 megapixel and at that stage I'd already accumulated really good lenses because I'd come through the film cameras which was the low-end Canon and I made my way up to what was then known as the EOS 5 which is a beautiful camera very good film camera. Uh, there was two higher than that. There was the three and then the one, the EOS one. Now I remember in the, in the old days, film, film, uh, shooting with film, the camera body didn't determine quality. It was the film that you used and the lenses that you used. So you put all the money into great lenses and you bought nice film, great film. Um, doesn't matter what in that series of camera, your quality of the image would be exactly the same. The perks that you got from a more expensive, expensive camera body were things like a better focusing system, or a better view, sort of viewfinder to, to focus with, larger viewfinder and um, motor drives and things like that. So it's very different to the digital world where your sensor size, your sensor quality can affect your image quality as well. So you've got a lot, of, lot more things to look at when you're talking digital. Nevertheless, I went for the 20D, it's a great camera, and I already accumulated great lenses. I bought L-series lenses for my film camera. I already had the wider zoom, I had a mid zoom and then a telephoto zoom. And I then had to learn this new terminology because what had happened is that with these digital cameras, because cameras manufacturers are trying to balance the cost of the sensor and the quality, they had opted for what is known as APS-C size sensors. Now, Canon APS-C is slightly different to the other ones. It's a bit smaller than the other cameras like Fuji is a larger APS-C. Um, but nevertheless, this was the balance that they had struck between cost and quality. But they had put so much R&D and time and effort into creating lens systems and mounts all around 35 millimeter film, they weren't prepared to get rid of that, that they still continue to use the same mount and the same lens. And what lenses do is they throw light over the film and it's designed around that film size. So the, the light perfectly covers that frame. Um, but with now the smaller sensor, it went beyond that frame. So hence what was happening is that that smaller sensor was cropping in on the field of view because the image circle created by that lens was far exceeded the sensor where a 35 millimeter film had perfect coverage or what they call full coverage. So years had gone by, 
they finally got to the stage where they could get the sensor size, 35 millimeter sensor size to match the film. And it was a big thing. They implemented it into the digital camera at a reasonably good cost. It was still quite expensive back then. It was the Canon 5D Mark I, which I purchased. And here we had full coverage. The, the, you're using a sensor size that was the correct size um, for what the lenses were doing and the mount was doing. So it was a well, perfectly matched system. And with the smaller sensor, the term was called, if you're using the APS-C size sensor, you're using a crop body. Now I try to look, at, look where the term crop sensor came in. I can't remember exactly where it came in, but it's way later. No one referred to it in the early days as a crop sensor. You, recur, you referred to the camera as a crop body. The, the emphasis was always on the body, never the sensor. Because those terms had nothing to do with sensor size, more to do with what lenses we were using with that particular sensor size. Now, people could say, oh, that's you know, arguing either way. But really, that's how it was. You called it a crop body. You didn't call it a crop sensor, which is interesting. Obviously, today, that's an interchangeable word. Some people say crop body. Some people say crop sensor. Okay, so now this really opens up the question as to what it actually means to have a full-frame camera and what it means to have a crop body or even a crop sensor, but I don't believe in that term crop sensor. So, for example, if you're using a 35 millimeter sensor today and I was to say you, you know, go and purchase a, a mount and mount medium format film lenses onto it, which actually people do, believe it or not, you can actually buy mounts. If you're using a full-frame 35 millimeter digital camera and you mount a vintage medium format lens onto it, is your camera still considered a full frame? No, it's not. No, your 35 millimeter sensor is cropping because the image circle produced by that larger lens or that larger format lens is way bigger than the 35 millimeter sensor that you have in the camera. So you can understand where this, this sort of terminology breaks down because you know all emphasis has been put on one sensor size and referencing that as full frame. It's not helpful, people who are trying to understand this, especially those people who are trying to look at different lenses, because I, I'd imagine now, I don't know exactly the statistics on this, but most camera manufacturers are producing full frame systems, meaning that the camera lens and body and mount is all designed around that sensor that they've chosen to use, whether it be medium, uh, medium format, different sensors, whether it be a 35 millimeter sensor, whether it be even micro four thirds or smaller. They're designed around that. You know, I think a small percentage like your 7Ds and your, you know, your Canon manufactured and Nikon manufactured where you had the mount system for a 35 millimeter system, but you were putting smaller sensors in it and you were what, creating what's called a crop body. And going back to my t sort of the subject of this video and what I said earlier is I prefer full frame, meaning I don't prefer full necessary 35 millimeter uh, sensors. I use a medium format sensor. I use a 44 by 33 millimeter sensor. I prefer full frame because I believe that full frame, when you have a full frame system, you have a lens and a mount system designed for that sensor and you're getting optimum quality. I think it's important that we know those words. Again, if you refer to 35 millimeter as full frame and you refer to everything other smaller than that as a crop, for whatever reason, as if that's the standard, I understand where you're coming from. I don't have, a, I don't have any bones with you about it. I just don't believe the terminology is used correctly, especially the term crop sensor. I think that's the one that gets me, crop sensor. The Fuji X-T3 that I use, for example, the X-series cameras, it's cropping nothing. What is it cropping? The lens is designed for that sensor. There is no actual physical crop happening. But when you work out this factor, when you're trying to work out an equivalence, you throw in the word crop. But what's it cropping? It's cropping nothing. There's an equivalence between that and a larger sensor. There's an equivalence between that and a smaller sensor. That's all that is. Now, again, I'm being pedantic because I know what you mean when you say crop factor or crop sensor. But it's important that I think it's important for people getting into photography that don't be misled by a term for full frame or crop, especially when it comes to marketing. Like you'll even see larger sensors have jumped in on the ball game and they've gone and said things like, I think the GFX S when it arrived was called super full frame. Technically, it is a full frame because it's a system designed around a 44 by 33 millimeter sensor. It's got full coverage, it's a full frame. There's no question about it. But they, it, you could see that they use that word not just to say, oh, listen, we've also got full frame. It's because they were, because there was a perception created, whether it be through the manufacturers or just in the photography community, that full frame refers to higher level of quality, that it's better, it's a higher thing. So 
so much so that even higher level cameras, in my opinion, with better image quality, we're now stepping backwards to try to compete in a market which didn't make any sense to me at all. But I mean, they know what they're doing in marketing better than I do, but they called it super full frame. The word super, super duper, I don't know what that was thrown in there for, but yet yeah, that's what they used. And, you know, those who get into, you know, differences between these sensors, you know, you really got to actually put the sensor sizes out and you'll see the differences in these sensors. And the arguments often happen between sort of 35 and APS-C, but like in the bigger scheme of things in photography, those are quite close in relation to the bigger scheme of things. So I wouldn't get too caught up in that. I would choose a system that best suits your budget. Understand that 99.99% .99 of the digital cameras on the market today with interchangeable lenses and so on, in the right hands, produce amazing images. So there's no excuse. So the system's not going to hold you back. Even if you buy kit lenses that are slow, you, you've got to learn how to use that lens and use it to your best of your ability. Some of my best film stuff that I shot back in the day uh, were shot on kit lenses that I because I couldn't afford anything else. And so it's important to know how the system works. Don't shoot it as if it's another system. I think that's the craziest thing, shooting a camera system as though it's something, something else. And this is where I think YouTube videos uh, out there have done a disservice to the photography community. A lot of these videos are factually correct. So I'm not mocking them for their facts. I just think they were unnecessarily presenting stuff that I think had no positive impact on the photography community. So what they would do is say, this is a 35 millimeter full frame system, they would call it. This is an APC and do equivalences. But what they were trying to do is trying to get the APC camera to perform like a 35 as if that's how you shoot on a daily basis. You're trying to get equivalences. No one shoots in equivalences. That, it's, it's not, it has no real bearing at all. So it's like, you know, and then people walked away going, uh, so, oh, do you know that that lens that you got, it's actually not a 2.8, it's actually an F4. They've lied to you, the manufacturers have lied to you. All they've shown you is the equivalence field of view. And you're like, what are you talking about? No, 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 it's a lie. Actually, that's what that is. Where does this come from? And they've actually watched a factually correct video, but the video, the way it's presented, has no bearing in the real world in photography. And it's left them with this sort of an opinion that this system is this and you've been lied to and that's inferior and it's it's a, it's a big mess. So don't get caught up in that. Don't get caught up in the hype of the term full frame. Understand that most of the cameras out there are actually full, full frame cameras. Understand the sensor size that you're buying. Understand the benefits, because believe it or not, smaller sensors have benefits that larger sensors do not. Understand lens weight, sizes of lenses, speed of lenses, the equivalent in speed, the equivalent in depth of field. Understand all these things, very important. And to work out factors to get to that uh, sort of answer in your mind, 100%, but when you get that camera, that's all that counts. Go out there and shoot it. Don't care about full frame and crop. Just do what you can with what you have and, and, and hone your skills to the point where you know that it doesn't matter what someone gives you camera-wise, you're gonna create an awesome image. That's what you're striving for. I learned this the hard way. I actually was at a wedding many, many years ago. I got my 5D Mark I and I um, was shooting away and the bride was coming down the aisle. This is in the ceremony. And I don't know if those of you might know that the 5D Mark I had a problem. And its problem was in humid conditions, um, which it was very humid on the day. The, the mirror in the mechanism was glued on. And the glue would soften up and the mirror would come off. Next thing, clank, clank, pull another shutter and I hear this mirror bouncing around on the body. And obviously couldn't carry on doing anything even to check because the bride's walking down. And I knew I didn't want that mirror hitting the sensor. So I was a bit concerned. So I put it to the side. I think I just slid it on the grass because I was on my knee down the aisle and I just picked up my 7D, which was a crop body, and I shot the rest of the wedding day on a 7D. Obviously inside I was freaking out going, I hope this camera doesn't go, do your best. But at that stage I'd already learned that this is the field of view I get. I had the same, I had a wide to a long zoom back then. Obviously I changed from zoom to primes later in my career. And I understood, understood what they gave me. And at the end of the day when I handed the images over, I was happy with the product and the client didn't know any different. Didn't know what I experienced on the day, how freaked out I was. They knew nothing. All they knew is that the photos were great and that's what they had seen in my portfolio and that's what I had produced. That day I learned, it doesn't matter whether it be full frame or crop, you can do it, you can create anything you want to create. And that's why when I decided later on, I'm traveling so much, I'm in flights every second week or so, I've got a lot of gear to carry. I want to carry it all in one bag and then just my light stands go in the bottom of my clothing bag 
that I had to make a change. And when Fuji offered me the system, I loved the layout of the system. I understand the dials took me back to my film days. I loved it, it was great. The, I could get fast primes is what I needed because I needed to compare it in certain from a depth of field perspective and I was happy with 1.2s and 1.4s and I knew that I could match it. The sensor size had nothing to do with the perception my client had when they received the product. Still today, no one knows. I hand over a product, they go, wow, thank you very much for the amazing photographs, very happy. They don't know that it's a smaller sensor size than the majority of the people out there shooting. It has no bearing on it at all. Um, I know how to handle noise, I know how to create uh, use lights, flash in certain ways. I've learned how the system works and no one can tell the difference in my work. That's all that counts. I hope that video was helpful and uh, maybe give you a different perspective of full frame and crop. Um, yeah, it's not going to be something everyone agrees with. I understand that. But I do appreciate your time and thanks for yeah, listening to me and God bless. Take care. Remember to subscribe.